Do we have um, Cheryl there? As soon as we, uh, as soon as the broadcast starts, I'll get confirmation. Any you second now. Should be getting now. it any second. Any second now. <clears throat> yep, she's on. All right. Beautiful. So, are we? Um, well, so why don't we start with um, approving the minutes from last time? Somebody want to make a motion? Motion to to approve. Uh. Roll call approval, Duty? Yes. Strumko? Aye. Carnes, aye. All in favor, aye. Joe, what's our public participation tonight, the beginning or um, the end? <clears throat> well, we do have a vote to take, so I think it's fair if we just do public participation first. Okay. Um, and it, it, oh, with the exception of if it's anyone here that is for the hearing that we're going to have re uh, regarding the tobacco license that you can you don't have to public uh, you can't participate in the public participation that'll be safe for the hearing part so anyone else who's not here for the for the hearing on the tobacco license public participation um it's me there... i'm here okay can you Give your name and address, please. Uh, uh, Shafi Muhammad, 93 okay. South Maple Street, okay. Westfield, here... Massachusetts. All right, thank you. You're here for the uh, tobacco hearing, correct? Uh, that's correct, yes. Okay, and we'll, we'll get to you if there's no one else here for public participation. I don't see anyone else on, so I think it's safe to move, move ahead. Um, so what we're going to do real quick, though, before we get to that, um, that hearing, because I think we, we have someone on the line that I, I'd like to be able to uh, set free a a ASAP. And it's a real quick conversation regarding the apiary regulation that we talked about at the last meeting. And uh, it's Councillor Oniski is on. Um, I just want to give an update. I, I am... Um, in the process of waiting to hear back from the state uh, Department of Public Health, they have a um, an apiary division. Um, I thought it would be best if if I got their input on, especially since they've dealt in the past with other communities and adopting local regulations. So I wanted to get their input, but but that's not something that happens quickly, unfortunately, and. Um, but I do have a little bit of an outline that I just wanted to go over about, um, and and my purpose for having them in on this on this uh, draft was to just make sure that we're not obviously omitting anything. I think we're all on the same page as far as what we want it to contain, and that is essentially um, a a a statement, a local regulation that states that we're going to require anybody that's in the business of keeping bees that they notify their abutters in case there's um, allergy concerns. Um, we dropped the requirement for the beekeepers to register with the city. Um, there is a voluntary program with the State Department of Agriculture where they can, they can register with the state if they wish to. So I think consistent with that, we shouldn't mandate and nor did Councilor Oniski feel it was necessary to have registered beekeepers in Westfield. So, so what we're really looking at is having a local regulation that has some teeth so that if we have complaints from neighbors about irresponsible beekeeping, our regulations will essentially say um, that you have to abide by the Mass Beekeepers Association best management practices. And that's a six, I think a six page document um, that I will send around. So if you can't find it, I'll, I'll send it in an email. So you can look at it, but I think we agreed to having that in there before. And then the notice to abutters about the fact that they're keeping bees. Um, the best management practices from the Beekeepers Association is um, even even down to the, to the point where um, they, they do mention lot sizes and acreage and setbacks and all those things that there's no reason for us to reinvent the wheel on. So I think that we can just defer to that. And, um, and so, so that's, but essentially that's the draft right now. It's going to be 
notification of abutters. Beekeepers have to abide by the best management practice, practices of the Mass Beekeepers Association, which is a six page document. And then if they fail to do so, we'll write in that we would do an investigation from the local board of health and could consider it a public health nuisance, which is covered under Mass General Law chapter 111, section 122. Um, and then we could do enforcement action on that as a last resort uh, preferably refer them because uh, the mission of all the beekeepers associations, whether it's whether it's state or federal, is all about education. It's all about making sure that this is done responsibly with the least impact to the public, and um, and also being a, a healthy hobby or profession, whatever it is for the bees themselves, and and also not to harbor or, or spread disease. So. All of those things are out there already. I think locally, unless Councilor Oniski has anything additionally, I think that's the, and also unless the state provides some additional uh, recommendations for what we should add to it, um, I think that's pretty much where we're at. So if anybody wants to add to that, then feel free. Hey, Joe, this is uh, Bill Oniski. How are, how's everybody today? Thanks. Thank you. Good. Um, I, I agree with everything and I thank you for all of your work um, on this. Um, but I, I know some of the slot size requirements for the number of uh, hives. Uh, I, I know some of that is not met right now. And I would just like you to consider, you know, possibly eliminating, um, eliminating that. I mean, if, if somebody is a bad beekeeper, they're going to be bad whether they're on a, an acre lot or a quarter acre lot from what I've seen. Okay, I mean, that, that is, um, it, it, and again, this is, this is the best management practices. It's a guideline. Um, we, we could either um, make a statement in our regulation that says to abide by the best management practices with the exception of um, the, the section referencing lot sizes and stuff like that, or we can just make it so there's language in the, in the regulation that says, you know, it's, it's, it's um, at the discretion of the department to decide whether or not to hold them to that, to that best management practice. Um, but I'm fine with it either way. I, I think that, you know, being that it's not a regulation in this form, um, the best management practice. I'm sure there's some way we can word it so that we we don't have to hold every single entire beekeeper to every letter of that guideline. Um, or we can just we can just say make the exception for that section about the reference to lot sizes. The only thing it doesn't do is it doesn't it doesn't really number sections or anything. Um, it's just a, a paragraph that says considerations regarding hive placement, you know, so, mm -hmm. uh, I, and, and so I'll, depending on, on what the board, um, what they think about it, I can write it in a way so that that will be either discretionary or omitted and it'll only be in a draft form. So you'll still have the opportunity to make suggestions where we can revise it before we, we take a vote on it. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. Does the state guidelines have anything regarding the size of lots? No, not really, the, the state doesn't, they, they actually have a regulation, the Department of Public Health uh, through Department of Agriculture, but it's, it's more for the inspection of uh, hives that are done by the state apiary inspector. And those regulations are not parallel to what we're looking for for a local regulation. Um, and they, I don't believe that they do mention lot size. Um, it's really more about the health of the hive and the, um, you know, uh, uh, reporting back to the state for certain circumstances. But it, the, the, the real one that, that, that um, addresses the setbacks and configuration is the the guidelines from the um, Mass Beekeepers Association. 
So I think unless we're missing something and Juanita had a good suggestion at the last meeting about adding the notification to a butters, um, uh, unless somebody has something to add to it, I'll run with that and also include anything at the recommendation of the, um, the state when they, when they return my call or email. And, um, and then we'll, we'll send it out as a draft and we can all take a look. Sounds good. Fair enough. Good. Okay. That's good. Thank you all. I appreciate all your work too. So all right. have Thank a good counselor. night. You Thank too, you. counselor. Bye. Okay. And without any opposition, we can move on to the uh, the hearing that we have um, regarding the tobacco uh, tobacco license um, for No Limits Two. Hold on one second. I just want to. Okay. So this is a, I, I'm going to give you a brief overview and, and, and this is a hearing. So we're going to treat it as such. We're going to have, uh, I'll give an overview. So you early and uh, how we're, how we're going to like to facilitate this. And then we're going to go into Frozen. You froze, Joe. Better? Yes. yes. And because I was just in the process of saying if I freeze up and, and go weird, I have a horrible Wi-Fi connection right now. So just um, raise your hand and I'll stop talking until it comes back online. All right. usually, Start usually. over. Okay. <laughs> Okay, where I don't know where you, you heard me last, but um, essentially, I just want to give an overview of what this is all about. And the structure of it will be it's a hearing. So we're going to go with the departments uh, going to present their case and the evidence of why the hearing is is for the board to determine whether or not the there should be a permanent revocation of the tobacco license for the uh, no Limit 2, a.k.a. Whip City Smoke, located on Southwick Road, and, and Tom will detail more with the address and, and the department's position, but this hearing is fundamentally, unless there's another motion that's made by the board, the motion that, that we um, would expect as, as the hearing um, wraps up is that the vote is to be whether or not to revoke the license, permanent re revocation of the license, uh, tobacco license. So uh, with no further ado, I'll let Tom Hibbert give the department's perspective and involvement in the, uh, the case before us. All right, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, good. So yeah, so um, basically I did send out all the, the documents of Kind of the whole case and everything that's that's gone on with this um with no limit two at 43 southwick road in westfield um since this all began they have changed their name it's now um, with city smokes um, it's owned by the same llc um, the ownership on i believe on may 4th the ownership of the llc was transferred from sean mohammed to his father shafi mohammed who is on the call um, so initially, um, over the past probably year or so, we have been getting some complaints um, about underage underage traffic, or at least you know people who look very young going into the store and um, making um, purchases. Um, the police had been doing some investigation of that. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, we didn't weren't didn't have all of our resources to be able to to go out and. Um, give the response that we normally would with a compliance check and everything like that. Um, so, um, you know, after talking to the police more, um, after some of their um, independent investigation that they had done, um, we went out on February 26th um, to do an, just to do an inspection. We didn't do a compliance check and um, just to see, you know, what they had in the store um, because part of the complaint was that there was the sale of um, flavored tobacco products, um, flavored vape products, um, all of which are, are no longer allowed per the state law. 
um, which had only gone into effect soon before COVID. So once again, it was another thing that we didn't really have the the time to be able to go around to all the stores and you know see see what everyone had um, in and their shelves and everything. So um, so it was February 26th that we went out and there was um, a lot. There was there was an abundant amount of um, flavored tobacco products, flavored vape products. Um, and, you know, there was a, a ton of stuff that, that shouldn't have even been for sale. Um, so, you know, given, given what I had just explained with us, you know, not being out with COVID and everything like that, um, we decided that it would be appropriate to give the store a warning, um, kind of let them know every, all the products they weren't allowed to sell um, and said that we were going to be back um, within the next, you know, few days to a week. Um, so I filled out the inspection form, um, which I did send to you guys, um, and we instructed them to remove all the flavored um, tobacco and vape products, um, and and that was that. So, um, and one other thing I forgot to mention is, um, in addition with the new law, um, for any any vape products that are on sale, um, they need to any retailer has to have um, a a letter from the manufacturer. Um, which documents that there's no characteristic flavor. Um, the only flavors um, I believe that are allowed to be sold are, you know, flavorless for the vape products or like a, a tobacco flavor. But um, the mango and all the all the crazy flavors that that were all over the place are um, are not allowed to be for sale. So not only can they not sell it, anything that they do sell, they need they need some documentation. Um, kind of proving that that is a, an allow, a product that's allowed. Um, so that was on February 26th. And we went back on um, the next thing I'm going to look at is the incident report. Um, we went back on March 4th. Um, it was myself with a few of the police officers. And we also had uh, someone from the Department of Revenue. Um, so initially with that inspection, the, um, the gentleman from the Department of Revenue um, went in first and did a, he did a compliance check. Um, so he made a purchase of Skull Spearmint, um, a flavored tobacco product and Puff Plus Peach Ice flavor, 5% um, nicotine, 5% salt nick. Um, so both of those are products that, that are not allowed for sale in Massachusetts. Um, and they, they were, he actually made the purchase. Um, we then went into the store and, um, you know, talked to Sean and, um, you know, he said he was, he, he had had six days. He said he was working on getting rid of the things he wasn't allowed to have. Um, but it hadn't, um, it had not much had been removed, um, on a lot of, on one whole case that was full of, um, flavored products, there was a sign that said um, not for sale, just for display only. Um, but the way Sean was talking, he suggested that if, if someone made a donation um, to him, he could he would give them um, give them some of those products. So um, effectively, they were they were still for sale. Um, so in that document, there's a whole list of of all the um, all the products that I saw that were that were for sale that. Um, are flavored, um, not allowed any vape flavored tobacco products, flavored vape products. As you can see, there's, you know, probably close to 20, at least 20 different products um, that weren't allowed to be for sale. Um, and there was also a few of the, a few of the Juul and other vape products that um, I'm pretty sure technically are allowed, but they didn't have that documentation that's required. Um, there were some products that um, when we were there, we're in a, a locker, um, which soon after we got there, Sean had locked it up. Um, later in the inspection, when I asked him um, to unlock it so I could see what was in there, if there was anything that needed to, um, to be removed from the premise, um, he refused to open it and um, so that he wasn't cooperating with the, with the inspection. Um, so that was March 4th. And then on March 12th, we went back. Um, so now I'm gonna be referring to the, 
the next incident report um, and the correction order slash cease and desist order. Um, so we went back with the cease and desist, um, which basically says, summarizes what, what they were doing that um, wasn't allowed. And it's an order to cease and desist doing those things. So, um, you know, no more selling the flavored tobacco products, um, vape products, and, you know, make and get the documentation for anything you are selling that you need. As well as included with that is a um, $1,000 fine is with the, the new um, state tobacco regulation. Um, so when I handed that um, I had two copies, my own copy and one for Sean. Um, I was trying to go over the whole document with him to make sure he understood um, what was what was being delivered and what was being asked. Um, and he asked to he asked to see a copy um, to read it. And I handed him his copy and he ripped it up um, and then proceeded to throw it into the trash. Um, so at that point, I had uh, had enough. So I told Sean that he really might want to read that. Um, it was important. There was a thousand dollar fine. He has a limited amount of time to make the appeal, um, which was seven days. And then I believe he had um, 21 days to pay it. Um, neither of which happened. Um, that was on, on March, um, March 12th. Um, and we never received an appeal or a payment. Um, so I think that was pretty much everything for that incident. And then, um, so we finally went back with the, um, the notice for this hearing um, that, you know, when you have an unpaid fine and, and those types of, you know, egregious violations and, and total disregard for, you know, everything we were doing, um, especially after giving so many chances to, you know, give them the chances to, to do the right thing and, and uh, correct the violations in the business. Um, so the next is the notice of intent to suspend license for sale of tobacco. Um, and that is basically just saying, you know, we're having this hearing tonight. Um, when I, when I went to deliver that on um, May 3rd, um, there was a new person in the store. He was the, the manager. Um, his name is Usman Butt. And um, I talked to him. He said the he told me that the store was no longer owned by um, Sean. Um, it had been it was now in under the control of the father Shafi. Um, and so I said, you know, we had these all this going on. So make sure he gets a copy um, and have him call me. Um, so Shafi did call me and and confirm that he did receive it. Um, I sent him over all of these documents. Um, that we have here, um, he did tell, and I'll let him address this part, but he did tell me he wasn't aware of, um, of the ticket and everything that had gone on, um, which I do know when we were there on March 4th with the Department of Revenue, I do know that, um, that Sean had called his father and um, I believe his father, is, I believe Shafi talked to the, the gentleman from the Department of Revenue on the phone while we were there during the inspection. So, um, you know, I think, he, I think he was aware of, to some degree at least, of, of what was going on. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's kind of, the, kind of the gist of it. That's everything that, that happened. And um, now I think I'll, unless you have any questions for me, I think I'll turn it back over to Joe. Um, before we move on any further, and I do want to give the owner the opportunity to present their cases, um, I just wanted to introduce the two other people um, regarding this incident in this case, the hearing. Uh, Sarah McColgan from the Mass Health Officers Association Tobacco Control and DJ Wilson, who is an attorney and with the same organization. So um, they have been very helpful in assisting us to um, uh, get this moving along in the right direction. So thank you to both of you and thank you for being here. Um, if you have anything um, that would, that, that you, you know, want to say now as far as um, something to, to bolster the department's case, um, that's, that would be appreciated. Your expertise would be appreciated. 
Yeah, I just have uh, one quick comment. I think, I think first of all, I think the department has done a great job, especially in the middle of a pandemic, to enforce the state law. Um, you know, responding to a complaint is is basically all that could have been asked from you in the middle of all the other health crisis that has gone on. So I wanna commend um, the Westfield uh, Health Department for that. Technically, even though you issued a thousand dollar fine, um, the owners of, of uh, No Limit 2 could have been issued at this point $3,000 in fines. So I think that they should be happy that all of all they got was was the thousand dollars on the first time when Tom went out on February 26th, they could have they they should have been given a thousand dollar fine then in instead of a warning that um, in the new state law there is no provision for a warning so I think it was awfully um, awfully nice of you folks to give him a warning and uh, you know, kind of move up the ladder from there. Um, so I think that's about it. But again, I want to commend you folks for following up on on uh, this situation and and continuing to try and come to a, a resolution with it. Thanks, Sarah. Thank and if I can add uh, my two cents worth, I'm actually from Mass Municipal Association. Oh, OK. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, that's OK. Um, and um, so on the suspension side, uh, the state law uh, doesn't have a suspension for the first time around, which is $1,000. But the second time around, it has a one to seven day suspension, unless you have something in your local regulation. I'm not sure you have anything in your reg regulation that lays out a timeline. So if you went with suspension, I think you would have to fit yourself into that one to seven day suspension. But, um, and, and, uh, and, the state regulation doesn't mention revocation at all, but there's always this long held uh, understanding that whoever giveth a permit or a license can take it away as long as you give uh, correct due process, which you have done. And so if the, the board would just under the general theory that you gave them the tobacco sales permit, so as long as you've let them know that it's gonna be a hearing and the hearing may include a discussion about revocation, which you have done, then you've done ex exactly what you need to do. All right, thanks, DJ. So um, we'll we'll do a, a you know a kind of discussion. Well, the board can have a discussion after after everything's presented. So I'll just give this now to uh, hand it over. You froze again. <laughs> All right. Back. How about now? You're good. You're back. Okay. So we'll have a discussion after uh, everything's wrapped up, but we'll give the opportunity now for the owner to present their side. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, good, ev uh, uh, good evening, uh, dear board members. Um, uh, uh, actually, um, when we get the store, then we had uh, some um, flavored tobacco before the ban into effect. So we had uh, stocked up something in the bathroom. So then we had actually to throw out and that's what we stuck up. And um, the next thing is because I invested on this business for my son who just graduated from college. And uh, so I trusted him that uh, he would uh, run this business. And unfortunately he did not uh, do well and uh, his behavior became uh, very bad. And um, he unfortunately, addicted to drugs and uh, he became mentally ill. And uh, then I tried many ways to kick him out. Then um, finally I was successfully, I was able to kick him out from the store completely. Then I took the ownership and uh, then I paid the thousand dollar fine to the, uh, to the board. And also I apologized to the inspector Thomas and uh, the officers uh, those who went there for inspection and uh, and un, and my son's uh, un, um, rest, un, dis, disrespectful behavior was, uh, you know, so I I apologized to them and, and also I promised them this would never happen in the future because I am going to run the business. And uh, so I would be 
I had invested a lot of money and then we had to close down for a couple of months for the COVID. And I have five children. And uh, this is the only business I have. I, I just, please uh, kindly look into um, my request and I promise you hereafter, you won't hear any complaint. Because now I own the business and uh, Sean is completely removed from the store and he can uh, never come to that uh, premises anymore because he's just uh, 22 years old. Okay. Um, thank you for that. And, and um, also I, I, I made the, I paid the fine also for your information, yeah. Okay. All right, good. Um, so I guess now we'll we'll turn it over to the board, and you can um, you can kind of deliberate if you want to have a discussion, you want to ask questions. Now's the time. Just to um, understand what DJ said about suspension. So any suspension is just one to seven days, or within one to seven days when it happened. I didn't quite understand that. Sure, uh, because I'm looking at your regulation, 2017 regulation from the website, and you say, uh, and oh, actually, I'm s oh, for a second time around, you say, you say, and shall be notified in writing of penalties levied for for further violations, but you don't list out a range. So if you go back to the state regulation, the state regulation has for a second violation. Uh, at least one day and up to seven consecutive business days is what's allowed under the state law. Okay. So I think you'd have to follow that. For a third uh, uh, violation, you do list out seven consecutive days, but you don't for a second offense. Okay. And there's three offenses. You are, yeah, for the state law has three offenses. But uh, for you have your, three offenses. For your local regulations, you actually have a first, second, third, 307 days, and a fourth is uh, 330 days, but the dollar amounts are no longer valid because there's mandated high fines from the state now. And how many official um, offenses do we have in writing against this establishment? Is it three? I believe you have two. So I think you've, uh, give, you gave a warning for a first okay. violation and then a thousand dollars to the second violation, which was very kind hearted of you, but <laughs> was uh, lean, looking at the state law leniently. <laughs> so, so, but I think you're at the second for um, suspension. Yeah, and, and so just one thing I wanted to, to chime in on that too, as far as the warning, um, given the climate with COVID and everything and being sympathetic to small businesses and knowing their plight and lost income um, it, it, it was at that point where we felt it was appropriate to not start levying fines on a business that otherwise was closed for a period of time and lost revenue. Um, so in fairness, and given the mm -hmm. circumstances, it, it, it seemed like the right thing to do. Um, and and I, I know that probably was more than fair, but, you know, desperate times. So we kind of just let it go at that. Um and and it, it just didn't it didn't work out the way we wanted it to. So um, do, do you have any other questions for the owner or for Tom regarding? Um, I have a question. The fact that this is under basically new ownership, the um, violations were with the son running the yes. store. Yes. How does that fit in? Um, in my opinion, I would say that it's irrelevant. Um, it's owned by the same, the business is still licensed in the name of the same LLC. Oh, um, okay. So what they did, I think it was on, I looked it up on the state website. I think it was on May 4th. Um, after the fact that we issued the, the notice for the hearing was when, um, was when they changed the, the ownership of the LLC um, from mm -hmm. Sean's name to Shafi's name. Yeah, I removed uh, Sean end of the month from the establishment completely. I, it took me some time to remove him. Then after that, I took the ownership completely. Okay. So, so he's receiving treatment in uh, upstate New York and uh, he's not allowed to come to that uh, 
establishment anymore. So as a practical matter, there's been an ownership change and it, there's, there's clearly someone else running the business now. It's got a new name. They paid the fine. Yes. Um, do Joe, do, do you, Tommy, do our paid professionals have a recommendation? Well, um, the, the original recommendation or the original ask of uh, was to be make a motion to do a full permanent revocation um, if, if you want to consider another motion I can give you another option um, we we have discussed this if you're not comfortable with doing a full revocation um, then I would say that a suspension would be warranted and also one of the things that we kind of cooked up because we can't prohibit we, the board, you, the board, can't prohibit somebody from being on the premises. You can't say that that individual who we've had a past history of non-compliance with, that they're not allowed to be there. But what I would say is that a suspension would be in order as a recommendation for whatever time period you feel is appropriate. And then also an agreement between the board and the owner of the property that the individual mentioned that we previously had issues of non-compliance with not be allowed at that establishment to sell age restricted, age restricted products. So we're not saying he can't be there and, and do other work. Um, we're saying that we would be looking for an agreement that doesn't need to be a written agreement. I mean, would it be in the minutes of the board if that agreement is made, if it's the desire of the board to enter the, uh, to, to say verbally, the agreement is that individual will not be allowed to sell age restricted products at that location. Um, and, and then, you know, if, if that does happen and it results in a violation, then the board could open up another hearing and, and then entertain the, the prospect for revocation. Um, so unless I'm off base on that legally, which, which I'm sure DJ would already be raising his hand to me, <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, but, but that's a recommendation I could make if somebody wanted to make that motion. Um, like I said, originally it was a permanent revocation, um, but the board can consider what, whatever they, whatever they want for punitive action. If there is a subsequent infraction, do we start at square one or can we put something in saying if there is a subsequent infraction, then that can lead to revocation without a whole other hearing. I think it would be considered a subsequent offense to the already existing uh, violation. Um, so I don't believe we'd have to start fresh. It would be, you know, the escalating fine structure and and the uh, corresponding suspensions, um, as it's what's indicated in the law. So um, no, I don't believe we would have to start over. It. it I, but I believe, and, and maybe DJ, you can um, chime in on this about a period of time, and I, and I, I get a little confused about whether it's a, it within a 12-month period, a calendar year, or what is it that resets the clock? Actually, the state law is now at 36 months, so okay. it, trum it trumps your 12 months. Okay. So if you were to do a suspension, it would make sense to lay out the letter how long the suspension is for, that there is a 36 month tolling period, that you don't want Mr. Uh, the, the son to sell age restricted products. And that the next time, if they got caught within that 36 months, they would be subject to um, the state's fine and suspension and possibly a revocation from the board. Okay. What, what, is, the, what is the fine at the state level for a third offense? 5,000. 5,000. And I think there's just one other thing that I'd, I'd like the board to uh, consider when they're making their decision. The state law took effect in June of 2020. And, you know, we were into the COVID at that, that point and, and uh, everybody was scrambling, <clears throat> stores were shut down, et cetera, et cetera. But nine months later is when the first inspection took place. So those products, you know, granted the store was closed for a part of that time um, because of the pandemic, but those products were on the store shelf and being sold for nine months. 
um, you know, minus the closure time. So, uh, you know, I, and, and, and the corporation is responsible for that. So I think, um, you know, that's something to consider. It's not, not like the inspection, you know, the law took place in June and the inspection took place uh, in July. It, it was nine months. And my only addition to that would be, and it's very notable that the State Department of Revenue was involved with this too. They are not a state department that usually wants to play well with us local tobacco control people. <laughs> right. Yeah, and one thing I did forget to mention, I, I wasn't able to, the Department of Revenue wasn't able to share their documentation with me, but they did confiscate um, a number of, of products um, while they were there. Um, so, um, that and then one other thing I wanted to mention is um, I know Shafi had had mentioned that there was um, extra surplus products that were in the bathroom um, and when we were there and even for the initial and subsequent inspections um, those those vape products were not stored in the bathroom they were prominently placed on the shelves um, right out in front to be sold so yeah, so having having all of those those products, you know, Tom had said 20 different products and having them out for nine months and having them prominently displayed. And then the whole situation of, is it a donation or are they, you know, really for sale it is really an egregious offense. Daffy, can I ask you if you were aware of how your son was running the business with the items there that were illegal and offering them for a donation? And were you aware that he had been given um, no. the notices? No, he didn't, he didn't tell me anything about the notice or anything, uh, what he received any mail or anything because he was not cooperating with me. As I told you before, so he was became like mentally issues. Uh, then he would come and attack me. You know, many times he tried to attack me when I asked questions. And even though I tried to go to the establishment, he didn't allow me to go there. Then, so we had so much issues with him. Uh, so he didn't tell me anything. He didn't cooperate with anything. Sounds like it was a rough time. Yeah, I had so much rough time. Yeah, I had so been through so much rough time. So if we were dealing with just Shan tonight and, and not his dad, I think my, my feeling would be to just go with the revocation. But I, yeah. I feel, I think I feel that we need to give him, the father an opportunity to run the business properly. Um, and, and, and if that happens, great. And if it doesn't, then, then take the next step. I think that's my feeling. I agree with you, Juanita. I think that um, so much of these issues happened under the son's watch and now the father is trying to make a go of it. And um, at this point, I don't think he should have his license revoked right now. So I'll make a motion that we uh, suspend Whip City Smokes license for one day um, and that uh, Joe uh, draft an agreement uh, or strike an agreement um, with, uh, with Mr. Muhammad uh, regarding the presence of the problematic individual uh, on the premises. We've got a 36 month period in which to see whether or not um, the uh, business complies. And I think uh, that that would meet the spirit of uh, what Juanita and Margaret uh, have proposed. Before we go forward with that, Tommy and Joe, how, how do you feel about that? I, I feel that um, it's, it's, a 100% your decision. I, I don't, I'm, I'm impartial to either way. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's very fair what you're proposing. And um, 
you know, if we have to be back here again, then we will. But otherwise, I, I don't I don't have a problem with that. Um, I, I know, you know, we might have went in hard nosed as a, for a permanent revocation, but um, given the history and, and not having any assurance before tonight that it wasn't going to continue to be a thorn in our side and a, and a, um, a problem for the community, then I, I think it would have been appropriate to just rip the Band-Aid off and revoke the license. But um, Stan's motion is, is a good one. Um, I, I think oh, quick, quick question. Are you in receipt of the, the, is the city in receipt of the thousand bucks? Um, we haven't got it yet. Uh, but, um, Shafi did send me a picture of the check as well as a, a receipt from the postal service for certified mail. So, um, I think it's en route, um, but we haven't actually received that, it yet. Yeah. That was express mail. Uh, we probably received today. Oh, okay. okay. And and I, I I would make the motion contingent on receipt of the uh, fine uh, the uh, the thousand dollars for the fine that was issued. Okay, and and um all, uh, it, it, just a little bit of a um suggestion for that is that I think if we came to that agreement tonight about the restriction of that individual not selling age restricted products and it wound up in the minutes of the meeting that that should suffice as an agreement. Um, and, and we can, you know, kind of expedite that, uh, at, at this time, I, I don't believe a, a written agreement would be any different than a verbal one right now reflected in the minutes of the meeting. Attorney Wilson, do you agree? What? I, I just think that's, that that's fine. Okay. Thomas, your opinion? Yeah, I did. I did owe uh, Joe's opinion there. Okay. All right. Well, uh, then, um, Stan, if you want to, you know, continue with that and, and um, we'll take a vote. Um, so, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll put a motion on the table for one day suspension. Um, with uh, contingent on the, the language and discussion that has been entered into the minutes. I second. Actually, no, we have to do the roll call. <laughs> right. Roll, roll call. Um, Duty? Yes. Stremko? Aye. Carnes, aye. All in favor, aye. 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 And, and just to, for uh, confirmation, we do have the agreement from the owner that that individual will not be allowed to sell age-restricted products at that location? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, um, so we'll follow up with that. We'll be in contact to, to do the details. I guess we need to, um, we need to set a date when that suspension will be served. Um, and we'll, we'll do that. We'll get those documents out. Okay. 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 Sound good, everybody. Sounds good. Good. Yeah. Sarah, thank DJ, you thank you very much. Thank you for okay. being here. You're very welcome. Thank, thank you. Good good night. Night, Sarah. Thank, thank you. Thank you for right. everyone. Have a good right. night. Take care. Thank you, Bye. guests. Thank you for your hard work on that, Tommy. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, so um, I'm looking at, I think we have, I get, I, we'll talk about COVID, that's all we have left, right? <laughs> so we, I'll just- There's always COVID. There's always COVID. Now, um, <clears throat> we're slightly limited. I guess there's a, um, another meeting that needs to be broadcast at 7.15. But that gives plenty of time for me to get on my soapbox and say what I would like to say. Um, we're, we've entered into a new realm of COVID now, and that's uh, not a bad thing, um, but it's also not a good thing in certain ways, and I'll explain. So our numbers went down significantly this week. I don't know if you noticed, but we reported out, or I reported out to... I, I'm, I'm more disorganized at home than I am in my office. All right. 
So better in your garage. I should have <laughs> just stayed in the garage. That's where I belong. That's what they tell me. So <laughs> last week um, on Wednesday, we reported out 44 new confirmed cases, 4-4. Four, four. We had no new related deaths and we had 37 people in isolation, active isolation. That was 44 last week. This week we reported out today, 18 new wow. confirmed cases, a huge reduction that we haven't seen in a long time. Nice. Still zero related deaths and 29 individuals in isolation. So the numbers are down in just a one week sample. So the one, the one part of the metric of that is the related deaths um, I will say, and this also plays into what the point I'm going to make later, yesterday on Tuesday, the state of Massachusetts, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts reported for the first time in over a year, zero deaths from COVID oh. in, in a one day. That's just for one day. Nonetheless, it was the first time in over a year that the Commonwealth was able to make that statement of no deaths that day from COVID. Um, and that reflects in our numbers as well locally. So we've gone at least a month with no related deaths. Um, we had a, uh, the, that last week spike of 44 was a little bit um, that we attributed to for no scientific reason um, because there was a, a, no other, no other uh, uh, epidemiological reason why it would have jumped up as it did by about a dozen from the week before, but that was a school vacation week abnormality, little glitch, um, which we expect those things to happen. Um, so now we're back to the true uh, you know, community spread, which is 18 cases in one week, um, down more than 50% from last week. That's great. That is really, really good. And, and I have said all along, being cautiously optimistic, as I know we all have to be in our positions, all, all of us, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not running around doing any dances right now. Um, physically, in my head, I am, because I feel like this is a good indication of where we're headed now. Um, I was worried we would plateau for a while and, and not go down as significantly as we did. Um, but we just plummeted. And um, uh, with the knowledge that we have and all of the other information we get, that, that is not attributed to any sort of a, a lab glitch or any sort of abnormality in reporting. It's all things being equal from the week before and the week before that. So uh, we have no reason to believe that that's not an accurate number. Um, so with that, and also the status of being uh, the phase four, step two, uh, as outlined by the governor, um, and some restrictions now after May 10th becoming, uh, lifting some of the additional restrictions or making things a little bit better, gathering limit numbers, percentages of people that are allowed in venues and things like this. Um, more and more, slowly but surely, um, things are, are are changing and as long as the numbers stay where they are and go down, continue to go down um, and more people get vaccinated, I, I, I'm not gonna say, you know, we're definitely not out of the woods. I'm not gonna say that. We, we are really seeing a trend though and it's throughout the region and the state itself, actually that report that they did about the zero new deaths made national news. That's how significant it is. And Massachusetts was recognized for that. What that means is, regardless of what you hear on the national news, regardless of what you hear about what's going on in other parts of the country, even New England, Massachusetts is doing quite well right now. 50% of the population, almost 50% has been fully vaccinated. Vaccine is, is readily available. Some, in some cases, walk-in clinics, not even appointments. Mm -hmm. Um, I have had no complaints about people that can't get vaccinated. We have, we still have contact tracing going on in the health department. The school departments are doing a great job of keeping the kids out. It's not being a source of transmission. Um, you know, things are, things are looking good for the first time in a long time. Um, so, so that's the good news. There, there's really not any bad news. I'm not going to be that guy. 
but I, I'll, I'll tell you that our workload hasn't decreased any with respect to COVID. Um, you know, with, with the advent of all of these things comes some general community uh, skepticism, anger, um, uh, doubtfulness, mistrust, and we are the brunt of that on a daily basis. So um, you will hear a lot of people that are coming to the forefront now with um, maybe it's because, you know, they're, they're able to be more uh, involved in, in what's going on in the community. You'll hear recommendations about things that the city or the health department should be doing to further combat COVID or to further bolster our, our vaccination percentages. And um, that is all well-intentioned. And I very much appreciate the people who have come forward and made recommendations about things that we should do more education. I think there's always there's always opportunity for that, um, so that you don't have this pandemic of misinformation anymore, and we can just deal with COVID. Um, but at this point, seeing the metrics that I'm looking at and the models that we're looking at and projecting um, on moving forward, it would be my desire at this point right now for us to not take on any more initiatives, any more programs. Uh, I don't want to add any more to the workload of a staff that is fried, frazzled, battered, and bruised. And I want to take the opportunity as the director of the health department to essentially get the blessing from the board that we don't upset the apple cart right now and we let the system work itself. And we start to do more of the things that we were doing before um, and obviously stand by and very close watch on the COVID situation. Contact tracing has proven to be a very uh, emotional, um, stressful situation. People are argumentative. We're public enemy number one. I never thought that it would turn into this, but it has. And, and I know there's probably a lot in the medical community that feel the same way. We're just trying to do our jobs. We're just trying to keep people from dying. And, and we got a lot of thanks and a lot of uh, recognition and pats on the back eight months ago, 10 months ago, and not so much now. And I'm not looking for that. I'm looking to have a pause. I'm looking to rejuvenate the staff so that we can, if we are needed for any sort of a resurgence, we can be at our best. I'm not poo-pooing anybody's suggestions about reaching out more to people and telling them that 16 year olds and older can get vaccinated and that 12 year olds can get vaccine. And I'm not poo-pooing the idea of, of more communication and more vaccine sites. It is just an opportunity right now where we have a, a relative um, downtick in the numbers where we need to take a break and we need to, we need to uh, gather ourselves. People are getting sick, people are not mentally well, and, and, and people lives have been put on, on hold to deal with this. I, I don't wanna add to that workload, even though, like I said, I believe all of these suggestions and recommendations from the people are well-intentioned. Um, I don't see the reason to have to do any more than we're doing right now at this point. Obviously, if the numbers go up and we need to step back up and, and go, you know, full on, we will. That's what we're here for. But right now, I'm only asking you that when you hear somebody say to you as a board member, I contacted the health department and I recommended that they do this because I feel very passionate about advocating for more kids to get vaccinated, advocating for more clinics to be in Westfield, advocating a more active role in communication from the health department as to um, what the current status of everything is. When you hear that and they tell you then they had, that, it, that they're, they perceived it to fall on deaf ears, there's a reason for that. And I will respectfully decline any additional workload for a staff, like I said, that, that is, is uh, there's COVID fatigue and then there's COVID exhaustion and we're the latter. And it's, it, I'm not crying about it. I'm not saying that, you know, this is ridiculous. It is what it is and we've done the best we can, but we have limited resources and we need to, we need, like I said, we need to kind of gather ourselves while we have some relative, uh, not downtime, but down tick. <laughs> 
and then and then come back at it if we need to. But um, I just didn't want anything to to be happening where you know people from the community are saying we're not responding to their requests and we're not doing enough. And I say, you know what? If it's not broke, don't fix it. The numbers are going down. Let's let's keep it that way. And, and then let's let's try to take care of ourselves for a little bit. I don't care if it's only for a week. I don't care if it's just for the next seven days that we try to take some time to, to recoup and, and, and not have to get yelled at every day and criticized and threatened when we're trying to do contact tracing. Um, so I just ask for your support on that. I, I, I want to do obviously as much as we can, but we are limited and, and we need to, we need to step back and, and take a breath. So thank you for listening. Is there any specific um, organizations or people that are asking and pressuring you for certain things? Um, no, it's really kind of all over the place. And, and yeah. um, it, it is, it is some organizations and some of them may come to fruition, something might come from it. Um, as an example, the, the state um, reached out to me to form a collaboration with the Hilltown um, Health Center to the Huntington Health Center, wh whatever that organization is, to, um, to get more of our, uh, to get more equity for vaccine uh, distribution in Westfield. That I'm fine with that. I have a meeting about that tomorrow morning. Um, but there, there are other things and, and a lot of it is coming from what other communities are doing. And we've talked about this before. Hey, I heard in Chicopee that they're doing this or in Springfield, they're doing this. Well, you know, it's, it's really apples and oranges. And, and again, I just go back to the point of saying when the numbers go down more than 50% in one week, something's working. And I don't want to throw a wrench into that. Uh, even if it's well-intentioned. I think uh, let's leave well enough and alone and see what happens. Well, you have 100% support from us. We know how hard you've been working. We're really proud of the job you've done and where Westfield's coming to through all this. And mm -hmm. if we could send you to Hawaii for the week, I know. you on a full, full paid vacation, we would love to do that, but obviously oh. we can't. <laughs> You won't want to. I don't think I'd come back. <laughs> Ham Hampton Ponds, Joe. We'll send you to Hampton Ponds. Hey, you know what? That's paradise where I sit right now. <laughs> but also, Joe, I think you have to step back and think of the word success. The Westfield Health Department has been very successful with, as I've always said, limited staff. There's seven of you. And look at the numbers you had month, week after week after week. You've got success now. We don't know how long it's going to last, but people should be proud of the Westfield Health Department. And I think that message needs to get out there. And I, for one, I can chatter with everybody and uh, I would let that out there. I mean, they've got nothing to criticize. You've got success. It's not 100% over with, but um, they're pretty close to it for right now anyway. Yeah, we need well, Margaret certainly speak speak for me. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it's it's just a you know I I don't like to bring these kinds of things up to you guys because it's really a you know it's kind of a departmental challenge and uh, but but I just didn't want it to spill over to you and and then have you have to come to me and say why aren't you doing this? It sounds like a great idea. I'm obviously any suggestions and and you know Juanita with the column that you've been doing, it's been, it's been enormously successful, but, you know, I was told the other day by somebody who's a subscriber of the Westfield news that they don't read it. So <laughs> again, what media outlet are you going to use to disseminate all this information? If you can't even make somebody read the newspaper that they pay for. <laughs> well, uh, well, between our column, between what Peter writes the mm -hmm. website, you guys have made yourself available via the website, via phone calls, and there, I, any complaint about a lack of communication is completely unfair. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, you know, a lot of it is just based in, in the fact of, uh, of people's relative resistance and not really COVID fatigue, but, you know, there's been so much time for people to get... Um, 
uh, uh, different information than what we provide that, that they're not in agreement with the fact that this is even a thing that we should still be in a state of emergency. Um, not that's not under our control, but really, you know, the contact tracing now, when you're telling people that they, they can't go to work, their kids can't go to school. It's just gotten to the point where people get very agitated about that and they don't want to comply. And, right. and, and, it, and it's a difficult conversation to have with somebody because isolation and quarantine is the law. And, and we don't just say, hey, if you feel like it, stay home from work so you don't get other people sick. Um, we have to enforce that. And I don't want to. I want people to just, you know, listen to the science and the medicine and do the right thing. But that is just me. Uh, I can tell you there's a large percentage of people out there that will flat out refuse to even participate in contact tracing. Um, and, and then if they do and you tell them what they need to do with their kids or whatever, um, there's a lot of times more often than not now where that is met with just outright disdain and, and abusive language. Uh -huh. Um, we're not in the business to tolerate that. I mean, we're, we're talking about nurses and part-time contact tracing people. Um, I, I don't want to see people cry in my office because of a phone conversation. This is ridiculous. So in order to prevent that, I think we need to stay steady right now. I don't want to open up any hornet's nests. I, I know there's a lot of um, there's a lot of differing opinions on childhood vaccinations. I think that's a parental decision with your physician. I think that the, the schools, should, and, and, and I might have to speak to this at the school committee meeting um, about, I, I don't know, is it just me or do we only have a month left of school? Why, mm -hmm. why are we so interested in rushing to vaccinate our children when this just became approved and available? Um, not saying we shouldn't, just saying, why is this an emergency and why does it have to be on my lap? And I, I would say you, you probably want to consult with your physician as to whether or not your child should be vaccinated and where and when. And I'm not going to be the one that's going to drive a van around the city going <laughs> to different schools to vaccinate people. We're not going to be the A team with needles in our hands running around, you know, shoot, shooting kids with vaccine that their parents may or may not want. Right. Um, and I know that's a whole process in and of itself. However, um, the, there is, there is <clears throat> from here on out, unless we absolutely need to, there is going to be resistance to everything we try to do COVID related. There's going to be a component, a contingent of people who are just going to fundamentally disagree with what we're saying and doing. And until we need to cross that bridge, I don't want to. So. Mm -hmm. That's all. <laughs> well, we're here for you, whatever you need. All right. Just just please Thank understand that I do want to I do want to listen to everybody's suggestions. I do it. I listen. I say we'll take that under consideration. We'll talk about it. But sometimes it's just not practical. It might seem like a great idea to the presenter, but the practicality of that and also the fact that we've probably already discussed it. Um, <laughs> and and I appreciate the help and the the you know people coming forward, I would have appreciated it more eight months ago, but that's a whole nother story. Um, and, and we're, I think we're okay right now. So let's just see what happens and we'll try and we'll try and get some sleep or something. I don't know what, I don't know what, what, what do you, I don't know what you do to decompress anymore, but we'll figure it out. Um, uh, we love the health department. So the only last thing is, I guess we skipped something at the beginning of the agenda, which was a vote for uh, you to approve me to review and oh, sign uh, documents for contracts, giving me the authority to sign and enter into contracts with vendors. So we just need a motion and a vote on that, please. A motion to um, contract, uh, give uh, Joseph Rouse, uh, Signature authority for the health department. Okay. Madam Thanks. Chair. Second. Uh, oh, yeah, I keep forgetting this every time. Roll call duty. 
Aye. Stromko? Aye. Carnes? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Well, thank you for not abstaining. Right. <laughs> it's <been> complicated. <laughs> um, so if there's nothing else, I guess we're, we're done. Um, and again, thank you for listening and understanding and just, you know, we're going to, we're going to take everything into consideration, but if it doesn't happen, there's a reason. So. All right, Joe, you and, you and Tommy and, and your team keep up the good work. And thank, thank you guys very much for your time you. and, and your, your uh, expertise. So we'll see you next thank month. You. Okay. Good night, everybody.